The Octarine Dream, a podcast exploring the meaning of ecology, spirit, and human relationship. From Southwestern Australia, I'm your host, Byron John. Oh yeah, get him, mate. Welcome back to the Octarine Tree Podcast. Today, I was chatting with a chappie who I've known online for quite some time. We both studied with Darren Doherty, who was a guest on episode something of the Octarine Tree. Harry is an agroforestry economist and land steward and athlete. He's always running around doing things on social media. Every time I see him, he's um, running, which is nice. He strives to awaken human capacity by planning and planting the trees that improve our lives and our landscapes. Before graduate school, he spent two years as a resident athlete at the Colorado Springs Olympic Training Center, competing in the sport of modern pentathlon. Once an Olympic hopeful, he competed on the World Cup circuit in countries such as Mexico and Egypt and at the 2015 World Championships in Berlin. Nowadays, he's the co-founder and chief investments officer at Propagate Ventures, based in Hudson, New York. Propagate Ventures assists land managers to integrate profitable tree crops into working farms by bridging the capital and operational gaps needed to plant and manage productive agroforestry systems. In today's discussion, when I gave him an opportunity to talk, we discussed dirty dancing, obvious, of course we did, the ecology of New England, his background in finance, the economic viability of agroforestry, and Harry's projects with Propagate Ventures, J. Russell Smith, and then, of course, I rant about Australian ecology again. So without further ado, a young man who is going to go places and make things happen, he's a real doer, Harry Green. Harry Green, welcome to the Octorine Tree podcast, mate. Thanks for being here. How are you? Doing well, Byron. How about yourself? I'm really well, mate. I'm really well. Thank you for asking. I've been looking forward to having a chat. Just before I hit record, you were saying you've just walked in the door from planting. Is that right? Yeah, we are up in Franklin, New York, which is it's in the Catskills, about two hours inland or into the mountains from the Hudson River Valley. About 75 acres. Is that? This farm. Yeah, go ahead. This is random. Yeah. But is the Catskills where they filmed Dirty Dancing? Oh, I, I, I haven't seen Dirty Dancing along with a whole bunch of movies that I would, would do well to go watch. Um, but it, I guess it, it's, it's possible. Okay. All right. Because that movie was kind of burnt onto my and lots of people's brains back in the, was it late 80s or early 90s? I can't remember. But it, I think it was one of my first introductions, visual introductions to what I imagine to be New England deciduous forest. Yeah. And it's just stunning. Like it's such a beautiful landscape. You're from that part of the world, aren't you? Yeah, I, I grew up in eastern Massachusetts. If you're familiar with Concord, where the American Revolution started, or the book Walden by Henry David Thoreau. I know Walden. I've read Walden. My uh, family runs a summer camp two towns away from Concord. And then I did high school in, in, in Concord, Massachusetts. That part of the US, I don't know very well. I mean, personally, I've been to California a few times, but I've never been to New England or the East Coast. And there's such a different vibe. I mean, the U.S. is a world unto itself, it seems. New England has always appealed to me. I mean, I was a Robert Frost fan growing up, and it's just always it's just stuck into my head as being that part of the U.S. is very romantic and obviously kind of way more attached to the history, uh, the genesis of the United States than most other places. Is that too simple a thing to say? Do you think it, the history there is far more resonant? That's pretty reasonable. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. The, the buildings in Concord, a lot of them have plaques on them with a date when they were constructed. So it could say 1720, for instance. And when folks from England come to visit, uh, actually a while ago, um, one of our family friends said, this is, this is a beautiful replica of, of what these buildings would have been like back in the day. And it, it, there was a bit of confusion, not in a bad way, but it, it, it mm. 
1720 is very old for us. Whereas in, yeah. in, in the UK, that's relatively recent. Yeah. So yeah, it's U S history goes and in the Northeast and in Virginia. Yeah. For Australia, like if to have an artifact of European settlement going back to the 1700s is as far back as it goes. Everything here is uh, shiny and new with, you know, a few exceptions. We do have some older buildings, but it's mainly the indigenous culture that gives Australia its sense of antiquity. I do talk about this with others when I have the opportunity. They're really interested in the differences and similarities between North American contemporary culture and Australian contemporary contemporary culture. It seems like the Europeans, when they arrived in the Americas, it was very amenable to their culture. There's a good Google image search to describe this, where I think the search terms are, if America were Eurasia, Mm -hmm. and say the Pacific Northwest is very similar to the, the Basque country up into the Nordics. Whereas the Northeast, say Vermont into Maine, yeah. is really similar to the, the North Island of Japan, Hokkaido. Right. But the, say the, the jump from the UK to Massachusetts w- would be a, a smaller jump than the UK to Australia. Definitely. Yeah, you, a sheep has a whole lot to eat. Yeah, I'm looking at now, it's a climatic analog map. And interestingly, down near uh, in the southeast, it's China and Taiwan, which is the uh, equivalent. So that is a funny part down there, isn't it? We have this almost subtropical s- summer, but it snows and whatnot down there, which is quite unusual. Yeah. When you grew up, because you, every time I see you online, you seem to be taking seriously good care of yourself. <laughs> How early in the game were you doing athletics and sporting? Because that's been a huge part of your life, hasn't it? Yeah. I started running when I was 12. Uh, my mother got me into horseback riding formerly when I, formally when I was seven. Mm. So did that from seven to 18 or so uh, pretty consistently. Mm-hmm. And then the summer camp that my family runs uh, all summer long, it would be say kayaking, windsurfing, hiking in the mountains, um, all sorts of out- out- outdoor recreation. That's awesome. Yeah. And you were like aligned to that way of life? Like you felt that in your bones that you were into it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, if, if I could be outside uh, with a relatively high heart rate with people that I enjoy spending time with from different parts of the world all the time, that, that would be a great situation. I concur, man. I love that kind of thing. Like, that sounds like a dreamy childhood growing up. Yeah. Sometimes I think that I, I got all of my desire to have fun out of the way. So if, if I, I, don't, I don't have a whole lot of FOMO yeah. when, I mean, I love hiking. I love um, going on kayak trips, but I, I don't get FOMO when friends I see going um, climbing mountains on the weekends and I'm, I'm back doing something with trees in the valleys. I'm, I'm more than okay with that. You've got it out of your system. You've lived a good life already, man, it seems. How, how old are you now? <laughs> I am 30. Okay. Yeah, turn, turn 30 in November. Okay, you, you strike me as a pretty industrious bloke. So what was your family like? Yeah, my, so my mother and father met in grad school in the MBA program at Clark University in Worcester, Mass. Uh, my dad had, um, he, he had been in the army for a bit. He was in, in Germany. Um, he, he, he jokes that he's a, a Cold War veteran. Hmm. And uh, my mom was a nurse before going back to business school. Um, so they met then, uh, got married a bit after, had me. Hmm. They they separated when I was four or so, uh, and then when I was five, um, my mom linked up with my stepdad, and then shortly after, my dad linked up with my stepmom. Right. And so, actually, I feel really fortunate to have four parents because right. I, I have different relationships with all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a I have a half brother who is ten years younger than I am. Mm-hmm. Uh, So I I grew up as both an only child and I have a half brother. So I have had, yeah, definitely both experiences. Mm -hmm. When you were going into university, what was your intended outcome? 
what were you studying and what were you hoping to do? Because it kind of took a yeah. turn into an unforeseen direction. Is that fair to say? I that that's pretty fair. I went into university. Um, I wanted a business school and a track team and a culture that would turn me into someone that I would be proud of on the exit. I didn't really know what that was going in. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, this is, this was, this is a while ago, but I applied to U, UVM, UMass, a few polar, a, a few, uh, smaller business schools. Mm-hmm. And then a bunch of schools like Dartmouth and Bowdoin and whatnot, uh, went to the university of Vermont, studied business and Spanish uh, the, the deal with my parents was you can major in business or you can pay for your own tuition. Right. And that, that was a pretty good deal. That's a pretty good so deal. So took the business major. Yeah. Ma- made it fun with a Spanish major. Um, went abroad twice. If, if you're looking for a, a bullet list of privilege, uh, I have most of the check boxes there. Excuse me. Okay. Well, so you have checked your privilege. Yeah. That's good. I really, I, I try. It's to. good to see that you're you're aware of it, but you strike me as someone who's aware and appreciative as well. You don't seem to take things for granted. You seem to be pretty conscientious like that. At what point during your studies did you take the turn into agroforestry and all things related? How did that come about? I was taking a horticulture course. Why? And oh man, I actually met the professor at the gym. He's actually been a, a, a great mentor for me for the past 10 years or so. Uh, his name is Mark Starrett at, at UVM. So t- took his course, seemed really interesting. Um, he, after that, gave me a book called Forest Farming mm-hmm. by James Schulto Douglas. It's kind of a tree crops by J. Russell Smith analog. Right. Back up a tiny bit. Um, you mentioned that if you have land that you're likely to have in a few decades, planting high value timber trees mm-hmm. is a reasonably good investment. Mm-hmm. I took that advice, planted a bunch of black walnut and black locust on my family's land. Those are my favorites. That was just a, that was an informal, hey, let's plant trees. Trees are generally understood to be ecologically good mm-hmm. and if i mean the narrative back then was if they, this can pay for my grand grandchildren's college yeah. education then that that seems like a reasonable um step to take you had an affinity for trees it would seem at that stage but it was it was primarily a business motivated decision or a finance motivated decision at that stage the the fi- there was a financial impetus but i I remember wanting to plant perennials mm-hmm. when I was 10 or so. My, I, would, I would garden uh, with my mom when I was, when I was really little. Mm-hmm. Uh, and trees, blueberries, all of the non-forested parts of one of the summer camps, mm-hmm. uh, I, I tried to plant with a, a whole bunch of different species. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that was kind of just a, a small foray into this. Um, but the... There was a point when I was in a corporate finance course and I was reading that book on agroforestry at the same time Mm -hmm. and light bulb went off, realized that finance as a language is a really good way to communicate the value of trees Mm -hmm. to a a modern neoclassical economics oriented mindset Mm -hmm. and communicating how future cash flows amount to value in the present and vice versa, it, it seemed incredibly undervalued. And this was around 2012. That's very interesting. And kind of, yeah, kept, kept that idea in the back of the head for, for a while. Yeah. That's really interesting because of course you look at these incredible tree systems of the past and and ones going in now and ones that exist now that you wonder of all the things in the world that I would like to see the relatively still accessible and affordable fossil fuels energy resources spent on is tree crops it's one of the things there's a whole suite of things but tree crops sustainable systems in general the one of the reasons why they're not implemented of course is because of the large capex 
and the amount of time one has to wait before they're actually yieldable and harvestable. So it'd make the viability apparent. Is that what you mean? Exactly. You'd caught the kind of agroforestry bug, the horticultural botanical bug. Did you did you study further in that direction? Not formally. Uh, so not in university. I so after undergrad had two years in Colorado at the Colorado Springs Olympic Training Center, just pursuing athletics further. Mm -hmm. Went back to the University of Vermont for a master's in business administration uh, with, a, with a focus in sustainable innovation. So um, business with ecologically, socio-ecologically sound flair, mm -hmm. um, kind of tailored those studies to agroforestry. Yeah. But in my, in my downtime the years prior, it, I, I, I took kind of the, the afternoons and the weekends to read the textbooks and run through the syllabi for co the, the publicly available syllabi because a lot of professors just just post what, yeah, yeah. what they re yeah exactly just r run through all that material follow up with hours of video content um and just try to learn as much as i could about forestry about agriculture this might seem like a strange question but this kind of thing really interests me um, as someone who's devoured a fair bit of content myself but for someone who study you've done undergrad and, and you did you complete your mba yeah okay so i'm just curious like with your self-study your the autodidactic side of things in terms of the quantity of the content that you consumed, where do you think it sits relative to your degree? Do you have an undergrad's degree of knowledge in the botanical and agroforestry side of things? Yeah, w with with a dose of humility, I would say that's pretty reasonable. Um, when I yeah, I th there's generally no limitation when say P I mean agroecology forestry PhD students and I are just riffing on um, general leverage points and ecology and economics and all, all of those intersections. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm just curious because this world we're in, permaculture, regen ag, agroecology world, there are, there are so many people who self-studied to get where they are. Uh, me, like personally, yeah. I did a diploma in horticulture and that helped, but I've had to construct a curriculum because to this day, up until this point, you can't go and do a regenerative agriculture or, I mean, certainly not an undergrad. I don't think there's nothing. One has to construct their own curriculum. So I often do wonder where the equivalency is. But anyway, I digress. I think using or just using the lens of econ to look at and look for leverage points in positive ecological change. Okay. change uh, be, because I what's appealing about the private sector is how quickly it moves it can quickly degrade ecosystems and the potential for it to quickly reestablish complex ecologies is uh, there's there's a lot there there's a lot to unpack and a lot of nuance but I'm I'm optimistic because it seems to come back to that so often right i mean we're living in an age now where i see this amazing organic flowering of human enthusiasm towards a greater stewardship of the ecology and i have some issue with the term stewardship but fuck it let's use it for now there are so many people ready willing and mostly able to get out there and do this work and want it to be done and there's like such a rich enthusiasm that we could take advantage of in a very positive sense but it always it just continues to come back to the viability of an economic model where do you think we are H how do we make it viable is it going to happen how will it happen is it pure like the goodwill and, and social will at a grassroots level or can it actually make a dime to the point where it's going to attract uh, investors there are, there are a whole lot of systems that can make a dime and those are the ones that are going to move the fastest. That that that's at least our uh, investment thesis. Things like black locust silvopasture, that's Robinia pseudo acacia. Things like chestnuts. Um, the extent acreage wise 
that those systems cover has to be supplemented with, um, yes, a, a desire to improve the ecology um, at a local and we'll say national level. Uh, one theme here is that we have to look at how we're defining the whole. It, is, it a, is it a municipality? Is it a watershed? Mm. Uh, is it is it the next size up in watershed? Mm. Is it a nation? Um, g- globally, that's a difficult question to ask or to, to answer. Um, are the are the, are the positive mm. externalities from profitable tree systems sufficient to make a dent in global climate change? A dent, yes, I hope so. At the same time, uh, the, the coalition of governments from state to national, et cetera, um, needs to put together a, a number of cohesive payments for ecosystem services schemes. And there, there are a number of ways that that can work. Um, so in, in the short term, yes. Um, profit Systems that are economically profitable can do a lot to jumpstart the um, the ecological reestablishment that kind of has to take place. And so you you see policy, some tweaking from the top down as being a all but necessary part of the picture. Yeah, that's definitely. Um, if, if we have faith in our institutions, that is absolutely necessary. Um, even if mm. we didn't. The private sector theoretically would still plant a, a decent amount of tree crops, and bo- both of those leverage points, right. the demand pull and the supply push, can create something that's ecologically pretty significant. It's pretty early in the interview for me to be asking this question because I don't I don't always ask it. It usually lands towards the end. But if you were emperor and you could shift policy, what would you be doing to assist this change? One thing that I've been thinking about recently is how much land the government manages, the US government, in terms of the highway systems and the waterways. And for say for riparian mm-hmm. zones or ditches in particular, um, kind of the, the easement on the side of uh, interstates and creeks and ditches and rivers. That's a lot of space. That's a, that's a ton of acreage. And those are relatively high leverage points to plant trees. And very expensive to the state. Yes, they have to, they have to pay to maintain them. Uh, you, you don't want trees falling into the interstate. But you, the, 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 the positive consequences, not to reuse the term externalities, but trees in riparian zones is going to have a positive effect on downstream communities, downstream people, water quality. Uh, mm-hmm. So if, if I were emperor for a day, or if I were a, um, a, a fly, not a fly in Joe Biden's ear, but a, a whisper, then that, that, that's something that, that I would plug for sure. When I was in California, one of the things that blew me away, the way they've paved their riparian systems. Oh, like in LA? Yeah, dude, it's nuts. What? It's fucking the weirdest thing. It's like living in a Mediterranean environment that pushes semi-arid on a good day, and they've gone and literally paved their drainage system. They've, they've literally turned their watershed into a drain to the point where, you know, movies like Greece, they can have hot rod races down these massive uh, drainage systems. It's crazy. They could, they could at least... Uh have constructed waves so you could surf in in the drainage. Um, yeah, that would have been thoughtful. Have Have you seen the movie A Convenient Truth? I think it's called about Curitiba, Brazil. No, it's I watched it probably ten years ago. It's it's worth looking up. I don't think it's it might not be free, but what they did was the, the I think it was a mayor constructed new housing, moved the. Um, homeless, home-free population out of the floodplains, the wetlands, right. turn them into green space 
uh, and, and rerouted or just reimagined and reconstructed all of the, the, the stormwater infrastructure of the city. Uh, mm -hmm. And now it has a, a really good ratio of, of green space uh, per capita. I'll check that out. My partner's Brazilian, so I'd be very curious to look into that. Let's talk some like nuts and bolts. Like you've just come in from a job today. You've joined us straight out of the field. What kind of systems are you actually putting in the ground nowadays? Yeah, so right now we are on, a, it's, a, it's a hill farm. Uh, it's a slope that would be fun to ski down. Um, it's 75 acres total. It's there 15 acres of organic blueberries. The question is, what's plausible, what's reasonable for the rest of the farm, the steep parts. And mm. I'll, I'll go on to other systems that we're working with in a second, but this, sure. this site in particular is generally aligned with the, the J. Russell Smith pitch of mm -hmm. tree crops, caloric tree crops in, in the hills, which are yep. not suited, not well suited to tillage. It'd be great if you could give us the elevator pitch on uh J. Russell Smith and who he was and what he did, because it's it's quite key to what you're doing. J. Russell Smith was a professor of, I believe, horticulture or something in that vein, who his work was focused, to say the least, on, on tree crops, uh, caloric mm -hmm. tree crops to feed people and animals, things like chestnuts, oaks. Um, what's, what's there are two words for it? Mesquite. Um, Prosopis. Yes. And yeah. I'll touch on my, one of my favorite chapters or sections of a chapter in his book. He actually cost models the mm -hmm. operational expenditures returns of, of several tree systems. And so you can, I, I haven't done this yet, but um, when I have an extra few hours, I'll, I, 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 I'd like to spreadsheet the data that he presents and just just mock it up um i think i think that would be a really interesting exercise um i'll i'll segue there into mm -hmm. um kind of connecting what what we do as a business what propagate does uh w with that so communicating the financial value of tree crops, we're working with larger scale agroforestry systems that can, that, that can and do work with existing farm operations. The general, the, the mission statement is to scale agroforestry into a cornerstone of agriculture and bring trees into a state such that they're a bankable asset. What that means yeah. I'll give you an example. 20 years ago, you couldn't really have solar in your portfolio. Uh, and, right. and now, now you can. And yeah. bringing tree crops, not, not plantation forestry or just tech R&D, but trees as assets separate from the ownership of commercial farmland alongside commercial farmland is, is that chosen leverage point that, that we're taking advantage of. You're trying to push for that to be recognized or it is being recognized now and you're leveraging it. Exactly. It's, it's, it's recognized on a small scale, but mainstreaming right. it is what we're after. Okay. So there's a window there and you're trying to expand it. Exactly. Back to this particular gig that you're on. Yeah. So the, the high level is chestnuts on steep slopes with about 10% biodiversity species. Right. Um, it's, it's a more, I don't want to say marginal, but um, let's say that the soil is a bit heavier, the growing season is a bit shorter. So chestnuts are going to, they're, they're going to do relatively well here. We, I mean, knock on wood, right? Um, yeah. But all, all the conditions are, are pointing in that direction. Uh -huh. What's the 10% biodiversity species? What would they be? It's, it's, a, it's a mix between native species that have economic value such as black locusts the, the bees are all about it mm -hmm. uh different sorts of shrub willow that can be used as um either either woody florals or an, any sort of coppice whether that's uh, a, a screen um for privacy or wind or sound um, and then 
So in terms of biodiversity, we're looking at all sorts of biodiversity, but starting at the bottom of, or relative bottom of the tro trophic pyramid, uh -huh. um, fungal biodiversity, insect biodiversity, things like poplar and willow, salicaceae, yeah. are they're again, I'm 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 not a deep ecologist, but based on the general understanding, they, they associate with both ecto and endo mycorrhizal fungi. So that's path a forest and pasture fungi. Mm. Yeah. They've got a real broad spectrum. Yeah. So bringing that fungi out from the forest edge into the pasture at a, at a relatively rapid or yeah, relatively rapid pace with fast growing species is mm. it's just going to add, um, a lot of what you need below ground and then just in insect diversity um as as a way to increase bird diversity and generally decrease the pest load it's not an absolute um way to address that but it's just it's just a factor yeah no i love it love it is that a standard template or is that specific to the context of this gig that's pretty standard mm -hmm. Uh, uh, in, in, uh, I'll give you another example. There's a farm out in Illinois that's interested in black locust buffers mm -hmm. along their organic grain fields because if field in the 30 feet abutting the conventional field, that can't be certified organic, but you right. don't need to certify timber as organic. Uh -huh. uh, so having that strip that maybe you can hay between the trees with a, a 15 foot implement, yeah. um, that in itself is the biodiversity. Yeah. And if it's within the context, you, you might add some species like red osier dogwood or different, uh, probably not willows and poplars because they, they clog the drainage tile, but the, the smaller stuff. Yeah, dogwoods, we don't have, that's cornus, I think, is it? The cornus yes. genus? Yes. Yeah, we exactly. don't, I, I don't know if I've ever even seen one. Okay, cool. That's awesome. And how often do you lay out on key line? You seem to have an appreciation for key line patterning. Yeah, it's, it, I guess, relative key line. Um, if it's flat, uh, yeah. north south grid, say flat and non brittle, then north south grid usually just makes a whole lot more sense. Mm -hmm. um, if this, this is actually interesting, on one of the Hudson projects, it's, it's mostly on key line with a few exceptions it's st generally go from valley to ridge stay close to contour depending on what you need to do with the water and don't make it awkward yeah uh is, is kind of the is kind of what we go for just because yeah. when it, if if you're not creating a, a a water park or a pinball machine of water mm. uh like like those videos of, of pa yeomans back in the day yeah um then the the angle of the rows and how how much they align to contour uh isn't isn't wildly important but yeah okay cool and what about animals you've done that much with the silver pasture side of things you do you incorporate them yeah animals I'll, I'll i'll give you an example there the the system that we installed and are managing in hudson new york so that's down from the the catskills the mountains into but the warmer river valley, that's a chestnut and black current system. And once the chestnuts are above browse height uh, and the, the currents are at, at full size or just, just a bit smaller, the idea is to incorporate ruminants into the system because the, the chestnut trees and the locusts, uh, they'll, they'll be above browse height and large enough where um, a, a bit of rub from cows isn't a huge deal. And then cows and sheep don't like the taste of black currants for the most part. Unlike you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> for those listening, Harry does this, he's got this spiel on social media where he, uh, he taste tests and reviews black currant uh, products and you've gone through a fair few of them man you're a connoisseur oh probably you speak the, you talk like a wine connoisseur when you're you're trying these black current well it, but black currants they're they're not a thing in the u.s so yeah, they're not I, a thing here they're fair um the the english love them the europeans love them uh 
and the the shtick over here is that they're relatively easy to grow. They have this really charismatic flavor, um, but they're mm. they're not in the mainstream. So as someone who didn't grow up with black currants and ribena, uh, I just went and taste tested about I don't know thirty products. Uh, the, the the favorites were uh, black currant pulp vinegar, and then this. But well, it's a cream inclusive black currant sorbet. So it's not like black currant ice cream, but it's black sort currant mm-hmm. sorbet with cream in it. Um, that, that sounds great. Oh, it's amazing. We digress. So ruminants in the uh, in this system. Another example: uh, the largest grass-fed dairy in New York is interested in silvo pasture. Um, they have a whole lot of wind kind of rips down the Mohawk Valley. And mm. so we're working with them to look at windbreaks for the cattle. And the, the, so that crossing over into uh, a certain number of acres of shade relative to how many days of forage they have on the whole. So that, that amounts to about 30 acres of, of shade that they need for the season. Right. So t- taller trees on that front. And then what's come up as a pretty scalable system, especially for wetter areas, is biomass willow and mulberry hedges. But Yeah, dude, I love those. Yep, I'm with you. If you harvest it, the costs put the returns into the red, into the negative, on the the most part, at least in, in, in our part of the world. Um, right. that's, that's not exclusively true, but you, you catch my drift. Mm. If you yeah. substitute the, so if you slash the harvest costs and substitute the price of purchased in hay and the price of purchased in minerals, um, yeah. then the return on planting willow hedges and mulberry hedges and just having ruminants graze them or browse them mm. rather is, is actually mm. pretty decent. Uh, especially yeah. if there's if the installation cost is is subsidized, uh, so that's yes. that's. Uh, I don't have ten years of experience with that, but generally optimistic, nonetheless. Yeah, I've never crunched the numbers on it. I just know from a like pure agroecological. If you remove the economy from it, it just always feels like such a good idea. And I've done it at a fair few properties in the wet areas. Exactly that. I've done white mulberry. And willow, willow stakes at high density and train them to coppice and people just usually run their goats or cows or sheep through and uh, don't have to harvest it themselves. They've just got gates and when the time is right, they let them in and that's that and it seems to work. It's so appealing. I find it so appealing. I don't know how close uh, the Lucina systems are to you in Australia. We've got plenty of them in the tropics, but not quite where I am. But we have equivalent species. In fact, there's some you might be interested in. We can talk about that. That light up but they're gone you all have really good media on on lucina just as as kind of yes. a, a use case for willow and mulberry it's, well, say one i think it was 1.6 x the stocking rate that that's pretty good yeah there's been a lot of work on lucina like there's pdfs and the agricultural department put out some a pdf of some trial here or there and there's there's plenty of them on lucina Acacias are getting a look in. There are PDFs out there on Australian natives for fodder, like the brachychitin genus, the uh, currajongs. There's one being penned, if not already been released, on casuarina obesa, the she-oaks. The Australian natives as fodder is a largely underexplored area, and Australian natives are usually pretty darn tough full of tannins and all other sorts of less than palatable secondary compounds. So finding the ones that do work is it's not quite as easy. And all, often you find the ones that are very palatable are all but gone because they just got eaten down by the ferals. We've got yeah. a lot of feral animals out here. Did you get out everything you wanted to get out about the system, how it's working, this particular system? Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think so. Um, okay. Just cool. what, yeah. Just the, the, I mean, the shade value of trees on well-managed grass-fed beef operations is, yeah. it, that, that's a good one. There's so many extra environmental benefits of creating a silver pasture or agroforestry system. Do you want to jump into some of those, some of the extra environmental benefits? Like shade's a really good one. 
Yeah, it's it's. I mean, with shade on hot days, I I, I would use the phrasing. You get one point six x the weight gain. But the, the the right way to say that is the University of Kentucky in their shade trials found that cattle with access to tree shade gained sixty percent more weight uh, and produced twenty percent more milk on hot days. And mm. that that's a pure in a relative commodity production system. That's that's pretty good. That's very good. That's that's m- most significant. Yeah, and it's something that's certainly not taken into account in Australia. Like it gets hot here. In case everyone listening who hasn't been to Australia didn't know, Australia can get pretty hot in certain parts. You see the cattle out here. I mean, it, it's something that historically it's just not been even thought about. Shade for cattle. And you see these black Angus cattle sitting out in the middle of paddocks in the middle of summer with not a tree in a paddock. I do wonder how deleterious it is to their well-being. Exactly. Are there any tree systems of the world, like if and when this bloody COVID-19 virus gives us some reprieve, is there anywhere in particular you'd like to go and have a look and with a notebook and wander around and sink your teeth into exploring old tree systems of the world? That's a good question. Yeah, where would you go? Calories per acre and calories per unit carbon is a really appealing metric or just just op- optimizing for that uh, mm-hmm. human, su- human sustenance and hu- human sustenance while um, co- covering a, a landscape in woody perennial vegetation mm. looks pretty good. Um, for that reason, coconuts and avocados uh, mm. I, I, I'd like to see the, the spectrum of commodity coconuts and avocados into loosely fully regenerative systems. Yeah. If you start yeah. with not forest and cutting it down for tree crops, but start with degraded land, how do you bring it back into calorie production? Uh, just yeah, because, I, totally. in, yeah, Cali, hazelnuts don't shake a stick at corn. At, at well, corn, yes, but coconuts more than anything. Yeah, coconuts, they're an oil producer, right? But avocado is one of these really valuable rarities in the plant world and that it creates a fat. They are remarkable. I mean, avocado, I would really love to play with seedling variety avocados. Um, they're one of these species that, I, I think I've said this before, but you can never quite tell how far and in which direction you can push a species outside of its native, the climate that it's adapted to natively. But for a sub-canopy, subtropical like Amazonian and Mesoamerican species, the avocados do amazingly well. Like in southwestern Australia, where it's cool Mediterranean in some parts, high rainfall, cool Mediterranean, they do incredibly well. Like there are thousands of these things going in constantly because of the market to China and whatnot. I mean, Australia, to take a slightly different thread, it's just dawning on Australians that the future of our nation has been decided and it happened a decade or two ago before we even realised what it was. And for the next 100 years at least, all of our forward movement in a world where the resource mining sector seems to be kind of slowly going downhill, slowly going downhill, all of the money is going into tourism and agriculture because we're going to be a food bowl for China. Basically, Australia is set to become a farm for China. So you've got avocados going in like crazy at the moment. And you just wouldn't you wouldn't pick that they would be able to be pushed so well commercially outside of their their native comfort zone. What does that feel like for, I guess you in particular, and what does that look like in the in the broader narrative down there? That economic trajectory, Ec- economic or um, ecological. Uh, okay. sociocultural yeah what's what's the scoop well i mean western australia is a weird place man it's like five times the size of texas it's just shy of half of the australian continent there's only about three million people in it and it makes up for like i, I don't know the numbers but it over represents in the gdp of australia because of the resources the mining here you know iron ore and and so on and 
we are kind of just seeing this reset of things. How do I explain it? The Western Australia like seems to endure just about any crisis the world goes through. Yep. Western Australia is like a blip. It doesn't happen here. Like we see it on the news. Some numbers may shift on some screens somewhere. Finance is abstract, but it, it affects real people in the real world. But here it doesn't seem to really do that so much. Like the, the GFC was just an idea. COVID is just an idea. We always just seem to scrape by. There, ha there is something to do with the fact that it's the most isolated capital city on the planet, Perth, down in the southwest, in a relative island of green surrounded by desert and ocean and with a relatively small population, a relatively very clean environment and a shit ton of money, yeah. basically. So it's strange, right? So West Australia was the, the strongest economy on the planet during COVID yeah. in terms of, you know, relative to pre immediate pre COVID. I'm, I'm grateful for that in many ways, in many senses, because I don't know what it would be without it, without that. But on the flip side, there's this kind of utter, we're fucking spoiled, basically. And we've lost, like everywhere else in the developed world, to a larger or lesser degree, we've just lost any concept of true ecological consequence. Yeah. And we have lost it more than most people. And in a place where the culture is so acutely maladjusted to the ecological realities of the continent, that is very dangerous. So like historically, like when I started my agroecological education, which is around 19 years old, 19, 20 years old, more and more, it was just dawning on me. Like I, I, I had this kind of like innate embryonic niggling, this anxiety, this existential kind of uh, anxiety about something. And it was growing and growing and growing. And it was at me developing an agroecological accounting capacity and realizing how fragile and precarious our situation is here if the shit hits the fan tomorrow if there's an interruption to like business as usual we're screwed like if the truck stop we're screwed for an area where there's a fair bit of agriculture going on yeah. our food security is absolutely trifling yeah. so um it's complex it's complex and it informs and motivates a lot of what I do and what I think. If I was emperor, I'd be doing things very differently. So from commodities in, commodities out, moving towards small scale hubs of food and culture and livelihoods. Yeah, I would, I mean, I would start with food security because there is very little here, very little. I mean, in the US, if the grid went down tomorrow, you would do way better than me here yep. for a number of reasons, I imagine. The ecology being more amenable, other things like your hunting culture, you would have way easier access to a rifle and a hunting culture and the animals. Like not only is it extremely difficult to own a gun here, it's illegal for us to hunt any native animals. Like it's serious, you get in serious trouble and people really, really frown about it. We have a completely different hunting culture in that we don't have a hunting culture anywhere near you guys do. Yeah. Well, um, if you want to hunt, just um, come, come take some of our white tailed deer. We have, and feral hogs. We have, we have more than we know what to do with. Right. Well, I love hunting. It's just yeah. bloody tricky to do it here, but yeah, food security. I would start with food security down here. I mean, it's tricky. The Australian bush you really got to know what you're doing if you want to find food in it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very different. Question for you on that front. Mm -hmm. In places like Arizona or the Front Range of Colorado, yeah. it, th there's only so much precipitation to work with. Yeah. And so you, the, the Climax ecosystem is largely drier grasslands, brittle grasslands, mm -hmm. at, at least in terms of what we can imagine. Yeah. It would be, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I personally don't know how it would, poss would be possible to move that into a uh, intact savanna ecosystem, although it may mm. be possible. Yeah. How much of uh, what was once dryland forest in your mm. part of the world mm. is is able to be reestablished with yeah. the kind of the tools and techniques that we're familiar with. 
Okay, that's an interesting question. If you look on a map, if you zoom into Google Earth to southwestern Australia, you will see, like I said before, the very the tip is a relative island of green. Yep. And then it kind of stops abruptly as you move inland. It changes from the forest green, the dark forest green, to a kind of you know paler, the paler green of pasture, wheat and sheep, ostensibly where there's a lot of rainfall further south, there's still beef cattle, but largely it's wheat and sheep. Now, that area is called the wheat belt. And if you continue to move east and northeast, the change in colour happens again quite abruptly. It goes from the paler, well, by that stage, it's a pale brown because you're getting semi-arid to a darker brown. That darker brown is where the dry sclerophyll shrublands, woodlands and savannah restarts. Everything in between the dark brown, which is the shrublands, and the dark green, which is existing forest, that has been cleared. It's huge. It's a massive deforestation event. So that all connected up once. The dark green on the left was forest, which just continued until gave way and biomes and species changed, but it was a continuous contiguous woodland system dotted with mosaic grasslands and savannas and wetlands all the way until you reach that existing scrublands on on the east. Now, that should never have happened. And it was a deforestation event, one of the biggest in modern history. In fact, I believe it was only about 10 or 15 years ago that the Amazon overtook it as the world's largest modern, like contemporary deforestation event. I'll have to find the numbers. I may be mistaken on that. So that's now, you've taken areas that were dry sclerophyll woodland with lots of soil types, but let's just call it sandy soil, basically. And the government has subsidised to remove a million acres a year for God knows how many years to grow wheat and run a sheep. And it's taken this Mediterranean environment and turned it into a semi-arid one that is continuing to desertify. And that's still being... Okay. Yeah. Wow. Agriculture is the new mining so there are still people going out now and ripping out riparian lines and knocking down trees because bigger is better, is more efficient, you know, these big combine harvesters and whatnot. And the soil is getting shitter and shitter and it's getting harder and harder to run sheep and the inputs are growing and growing and everything's eroding. And I don't mean to demonise the agricultural community. I don't at all. I actually have a great respect for them and they are stuck between a rock and a hard place, you know, having to grow provide food in this kind of environment in a commodity sector industry where they have no say on any of the anything that the prices are all set and then that you have this growing recognition of the need to act upon it but how the hell do you make that economically viable common land you know common land yeah yeah so they came over one of their partners is a southwest australian outfit called wide open agriculture and who also do dirty clean food the common land came over and they had a guy who was doing his master's thesis in ecological economics or or the equivalent whatever it was called and he was he was doing a paper he he consulted with me about the idea the model of reforesting the wheat belt and turning it into back into savannah like a dehesa model and they crunched all the numbers and I don't think it broke even in the end. Like that that's a really good example of it needing to be done, but God, how the hell do we actually uh, incentivize people to do it? The other thing is in Australia, if you consider yourself environmentally aware and ecologically literate and active, there's a very, very high chance that that person will be of a strong environmental conservationism, conservationist position. Yeah. which is pretty much saying like everything, it's got to be endemic, endemic, endemic. The best thing we can do for the land is to put a fence around it and keep people and animals out of it unless we're spraying glyphosate, yeah. right? It's kind of weird. And that's a whole discussion. You probably guess where I stand on the weed side of the argument is that, you know, it's not ideal, but certainly not the biggest of our problems and they can actually be incredibly useful. And in this situation, you've got... Again, areas that you you were like a Mediterranean dry sclerophyll woodland are now semi-arid, moving toward a dust bowl with incredible salinity issues. I mean, again, if you go on Google Earth and look over this part of the world, you will see salt scars on the land the size of Manhattan. 
and growing, right? That's not rare at all. Like they're immense, these things. There's not an endemic species out there that you can go and grow in a nursery and plant in that ground and have it survive. It's not the environment that it evolved in. It's the same geographic location, but it's not the same environment. And you've got all these species, you know, from around the world that can do the job, that can start remediating that land and, you know, locking up salt, fostering all of the environmental functions and ecological functions that need to be done, habitat, wind mitigation, you know, erosion mitigation, et cetera, et cetera. But no, we can't do it because they're not native. So we got a long way to go here. That was an extremely long-winded answer. But your original question about like Colorado, I mean, it's doable. It's just a matter of time. Colorado strikes me, it's kind of cool dry, isn't it? It gets extremely cold there as well, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's yeah. Zone, zone 5. I don't... I, there might be zone six, but it goes to four to three in the mountains. Well, the question would be, what was it before arrival of Europeans? Was it savannah? Yeah. Was it steppe? I've, I've only seen old paintings of, say, sparse elms out yeah. on, well, I, yeah, savannah. I don't know when or if it was tilled or to what extent. Um, mm. Colorado ecologists would have, would have more on that. Yeah. Um, but just just to touch on one of the things you're bringing up, I, I really enjoyed the chapter in Rowan Reed's book or the, mm -hmm. the section, the section there where he talked about the coast redwood from the, the U.S. as far as I know, or from North America, um, yeah. holding the soil particles together in those saline soils. Um, that, that, that just stuck out as a as an example of a non-native species doing work that the, that the locals couldn't um, just 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 couldn't make up for. Yeah, there's. I mean, I appreciate the position. I just think the whole one the horse is bolted. Yep. Same goes with feral animals. The horse is bolted. I mean, it's we can't seem to find the social political will to get other very basic things done to rearrange the planet in terms of its ecology or its you know, location of species back to how it was pre-European colonialism, I guess is where you'd have to go. I just think it's absolute folly. These things are here to stay. Yeah. They're here to stay. And look, I'm all for investing some resources in those certain parts of the world where you still have an intact virgin ecology. Yeah, by all means. And yes, there are times, of course, where there are species that absolutely wreak havoc and Australia has seen its fair share of them the prickly pear and the cane toad and, and that kind of thing. So I'm not wiping my hands clean of that need. Feral cats. Yeah, all of that. Yeah. yeah, they're here to stay. And in the meantime, we've done a shit ton of damage and uh, we're going to use every tool in our toolkit. Yeah. The resource space we have to create, to create the future resource space that we want. Yeah. And I mean, I don't think the earth gives a shit what species is being used. Yep. I've just consulted this climatic analog map of the US and it says Colorado reflects Afghanistan. Yep. I would start with the pre-industrial dynamic of the place. I mean, apart from getting the, all the meteorological specs you can on it and just getting a really good grasp of the ecology as it stands now, try to uh, familiarise yourself with the pre-industrial state and its climatic analogs and just see what's been done there. Yep. That's a good start. Absolutely. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking... It's in, in the Northeast U.S. It, mm. Without human intervention, you, you largely get what you started with. N not, yeah. to the, not to the degree, but in, in, in this non-brittle climate. It's the non-brittle. That's the key. We have 36-inch diameter oak trees that just mm. come, come back. Yeah. Uh, and maybe the, the white pines aren't... 400 feet tall anymore. Um, Stefan Sokowiak told us a story once about how mm -hmm. the Royal Navy needed 180 foot masts that were clear. So mm. no branches for something like 180 feet up. Mm. And to have a tree that tall, what, how, how tall is that? How, how actually, how tall is that tree? In, to, mm. in total, and I, I mean, can consult a, consult a um, I don't know, a historical forester. 
Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's remarkable. Have you read the book Oak by L- L- Logan, William Bryant Logan, I think his name is? It's called Oak, the Framing of Civilization. And there's a it's all about how Oak played such an important role in, in human history. You'd love it if you haven't read it. And there's a whole chapter on boat building and how boat builders used to walk around the king's forests looking at certain trees and, and hunting out specific boughs, bows, the boughs of a tree, the boughs growing in a bow to create the bow of a ship because you needed the wood to actually be growing in a certain grain. You couldn't just go and get a straight saw log and bend it. You actually had to craft it from the right bow. So that's a lost art and a lost appreciation. Yep. Wow. Mate, I've probably held you long enough at this stage. I've really enjoyed the chat, and you actually gave me a good opportunity to rant toward the end there, which was nice. Thank you for that. Of course, yeah. Uh, Great, great to be on here. Uh, I'd love to talk more about the ecology of australia it's not not a place i've been but um maybe someday if it uh yeah if it, if it makes sense oh mate I'm, I'm sure there'd be good reason come over and you've got a place to stay if and when you you do come and we can have you back on here and, and chat more further down the track i mean i've i've only got through about half of the things i wanted to ask you so awesome plenty more to talk about that sounds great so before you go, mate, would you be able to give the listeners a little bit of an idea of where they could go if they want to get hold of your work? Yeah. Have a look at what you do? Of course. Uh, main place to find us is propagateventures.com. Uh, we also have propagate.org, which is our news site. And then mm-hmm. we're on social media, Facebook, Instagram. Cool. You broke up there a bit. What was your website again? It's propagateventures.com. Okay. Awesome. Got it. Okay, mate, Harry Green, thank you so much, mate, for taking the time. Been awesome to chat. Thanks so much, Byron. All right, mate. All the best. Speak soon. Thank you.